Nancy Stevenson, president of the Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy. The Adlai Stevenson Center has invited its longtime friend and admired political and congressional observer to introduce Robert Pape and the latest report from the University of Chicago's Project on Security and Threats. Norm Ornstein is the author of many books on Congress and the State of the Nation. C-SPAN, CBS, CNN, Fox News Channel, MSNBC, PBS, The New York Times, and The Economist are among the many who turn to him for commentary on national trends and happenings. The Stevenson Center believes that true information, if shared with the public, can create changes that become essential, it can create actions that become essential changes in our lives, our politics, and our nation. Thus, we are pleased to host this release of Robert Pape's report in conversation with Norman Ornstein, who will moderate the questions following Professor Pape's presentation. Uh, the Q&A box, it will be on your screen for your questions after Robert Pape's uh, presentation. And we want you to know that the um, Washington Post has uh, released uh, as an article today in today's paper with releasing um, the document. Norm, the mic is yours. Thanks so much, Nancy. And thanks to the Stevenson Center, which is uh, such a vital contributor to uh, the dialogue that we're having around democracy and nothing more important now. And I'm delighted that you've all joined us for uh, an extraordinary uh, presentation that we will see uh, in depth look at uh, the danger that we face in America right now from one of the most distinguished scholars of international security affairs and terrorism studies, Robert Pape, a professor of political science at the University of Chicago and the founding director of the Chicago Project on Securities and Threats. While uh, Professor Pape has focused more uh, overseas on terrorism studies and has done, of course, a whole lot more. He's looked at economic sanctions, uh, humanitarian intervention policy, US-China relations, American grand strategy, all of which are tied together and relevant. He's become more concerned, as uh, I think all of us have, with the trends towards political violence in America and uh, both non-lethal, and now we're seeing lethal violence, and of course was stunned and struck by the January 6th violent insurrection on the Capitol. Um, I would note that we've now had two more of the Capitol police officers die by suicide. Um, more police officers, by the way, uh, die of suicide than in the line of duty in the United States. But if you think about the stresses that were caused for people trying to protect the Capitol against this huge and violent mob, um, it's a tragedy that is uh, unfortunately not unexpected. And it's something we can't allow to happen again. And now what we're seeing is Professor Pape is looking in depth at it Americans, is. at uh, challenges to insurrection. And through uh, the uh, center, uh, the Chicago Project on Security and Threats, or CPOST, in the last six months, he's conducted five major studies and including national surveys done through uh, NORC, the National Opinion Research Center, one of the most significant independent uh, social research centers in the United States. Anyone who knows public opinion knows it, that will look at some of these issues and he will give us a presentation. After that, uh, the two of us will have a little dialogue and then we will open it up. I hope you will prepare your questions. So let me turn it over to Bob Pape. Thank you, Mark.
What is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America? What caused that? To avoid a repeat of the January 6th assault on the Capitol and similar attacks, we need a fine-grained diagnosis of the scope and drivers of the insurrectionist movement to develop an effective risk assessment of political violence in the 2022 midterm and 2024 U.S. presidential elections. It's helpful to compare CPOS approach to understanding the insurrectionist movement to the approach we took with COVID. In stage one with COVID, we discovered there was a virus. That equates to the January 6th insurrection. Then we went further and we developed an understanding of the initial stages. And that is our first set of studies, which we published in The Atlantic and other places, including in the Washington Post in April. We're now in stage three, which equates to extensive testing just as occurred with COVID. In stage three, we are looking at in detail uh, the insurrectionist sentiments in the general population. I'll be talking about stage four at the end. Our goals in our June, to, um, that we just did in June, our June survey uh, were very pointed because they followed on the heels of other work that we did. First, we asked more pointed questions about election-related violence. Second, we widened the aperture from what we had done before to search for additional risk factors. Third, we specifically wanted to know about the impact of social versus traditional media. We also wanted to identify what influences the movement. In a nutshell, we discovered that the insurrectionist movement is continuing it's larger and more dangerous than we previously assessed in March. It's driven by two distinct beliefs, the great replacement idea about the rights of African-American and Hispanics exceeding the rights of whites, and the QAnon cult idea that there is a satanic cult of pedophiles running the US government. Further, we discovered that the insurrectionists are not necessarily who you think they are or where live where you would expect. We also discovered a surprising source of potential influence. Let's talk about the size of the insurrectionist movement. We define the size of the insurrectionist movement according to the political grievances which are associated with force, and also the capacity to engage in organized violence. In our survey, we specifically asked whether respondents agreed that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump and that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president, a harder edge question. We also asked whether they agreed that the use of force is justified to restore Donald Trump to the presidency arguably at the heart of what we mean by the insurrectionist movement. We also ask questions about gun ownership, support for militia groups and military experience, as you'll see. We found that there are surprising answers to those two radical questions. We found that 9% of American adults, 9% agree that the use of force to restore Donald Trump to the White House is justified. That equates to 23 million American adults. We further found that 26% agree that Joe Biden stole the 2020 election and that Biden is an illegitimate president. 
that equates to 65 million American adults. And you're about to see how these intersect. First, let's look at the actual responses so you can see the distribution of the 23 million who support force to restore Trump to the presidency. You can see that 12 million or 5% of American adults strongly agree with this. Another 4% or 9 million somewhat agree, but also quite worrisomely, notice that 47 million are ambivalent about this issue. Next, let's unpack um, those who believe Biden is an illegitimate president. And again, what you see is 16% or 41 million American adults strongly agree. Another 10% or 24 million somewhat agree. And also quite worrisomely, 47 million are ambivalent about this issue. Overall, we can look at who agrees with both. And what we discovered is that 8% of um, American adults, that equates to 21 million, believe both that Biden is an illegitimate president and that the use of force to restore Trump is justified. That's a striking number, and that's a number which we stress tested, and it's very important to understand that we are doing this based on a nationally representative sample, the gold standard of uh, techniques with the National Opinion Research Council, the gold standard of polling agencies. So the data here is quite sound. Now, how can you trust the polls? How can you trust it? we looked at the stability of responses across the categories. And for those who agree that force is justified to restore Trump to the presidency, of that uh, 23 million, 90% think Biden is an illegitimate president. And nearly 70, 69% think force is needed to preserve America's traditional way of life. Now, these highly adamant insurrectionists who hold multiple radical beliefs at the lower bound equal at least 15 million American adults. We further found that the 21 million adamant insurrectionists are highly urban. We found that nearly three quarters of those who agree that force is justified to restore Trump and that Biden is illegitimate reside in metro areas. And that's really striking since most people presume this is mainly a rural movement. We further found that the 21 million are not only Republicans. Yes, the 21 million who believe that force is justified to restore Trump and that Biden is illegitimate, 51% are Republican, but 34% self-identify as independent, 10% self-identify as Democratic. That means that the insurrectionist movement has evolved into a cross-party phenomenon. It's not just a split within the Republican Party. We further wanted to assess anti-government sentiment. So we asked questions pointedly about, do the respondents see the government as an enemy? And yes, it's true that 47% of the 21 million see the federal government as an enemy. It's also true that 24% see the police as an enemy, but it's important to know that this is not unique to the movement. Uh, especially in the ambivalent categories, we see nearly the same numbers. And that's why we don't consider this as a true driver of the movement. Further, we found that the 21 million are dangerous with significant capacity for violent organizational growth. We ask pointed questions. These are survey results, not extrapolations from other facts. 4% of the 21 million are themselves militia members or personally know a militia member. That equates to a million people. 
further, 27% support militias like the Oath Keepers or extremist groups like the Proud Boys. That's 16, 6 million that are ripe for recruitment by these groups. 32% own at least uh, one gun, that's 7 million people. 15% have prior military service in the US military, that's 3 million people. And of course, in a country as well off as the United States in this day and age, all have easy access to internet tools for rapid organization. Quite a significant capacity for violent organizational growth. Now let's look at beliefs inside the movement and sources of their, of their media. We discovered two major beliefs in the movement that are driving people into the movement. 63% of the 21 million believe the great replacement idea that African um, uh, American people and Hispanic people will eventually have more rights than whites. 54% believe the QAnon cabal idea that there's a secret group of satanic worshiping pedophiles running the US government. We further found that those two beliefs are statistically significant separators between the movement and the general population. Believing the QAnon cabal belief increases the odds of being in the movement um, by 645%, uh, huge amount. The Great Replacement increases it nearly 300%. And both of those are statistically significant. That is, these are odds far greater than chance, just flipping a coin. Notice that being Republican, belief in the end times, that religious idea of the second coming, and that government is an enemy, and even economic concerns are far lower, and none of those are statistically different from the general population. We further found that these two core beliefs do not overlap. That is, although a portion of the movement believe both the Great Replacement and the QAnon cabal, significant portions actually believe one or the other. This means that there are actually multiple pathways into the movement. We further studied their news consumption, especially found important findings of the 21 million. 56% of the 21 million uh, use at least one mainstream media outlet. 40% use at least one social media platform. Only 21% of the movement use only social media. This means that the 21 million, the insurrectionist movement in the country today is not primarily a social media phenomenon. We further looked at specific channels and specific sources and also discovered some important findings. We discovered that the most important uh, in the traditional media, which is the largest part of our movement, the most important source is are the new television cable channels of Newsmax and One America. These put the odds, uh, if you watch these routinely and see them as a major source of news, this increases the odds of being in the movement 161%. Fox, far lower as a percent, and it's one, Newsmax and One America that are statistically different than the general population. We further found that right-wing social media does increase the odds of being in the movement, even though this is a smaller pool of the overall insurrectionist movement. And let's show you a little bit more about that. When we look specifically inside of um, uh, social media, we can see that um, uh, 8chan, we can see that Infowars um, are by far the most important uh, media sources, uh, social media sources or online media sources for the movement. Um, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, the much more common, really not statistically different than the general population. 
This is very important because although these are very tiny populations within the 21 million, um, they are very, very tightly associated with being in the movement. Now let's look at uh, air sources of influence. One of our surprising discoveries as we looked into um, does do people view the government as an enemy is that we discovered that yes, it's true that within the movement, 47% view the federal government as an enemy, but 22% actually view the move uh, within the movement, 22% actually view the government as a friend. Another 31% are ambivalent. That is 53% within the 21 million don't view the government as an enemy. We further found that that specifically occurs mostly in urban areas. So recall, urban is the largest portion of the 21 million and people in urban areas far more than rural areas don't see the federal government as an enemy. And most striking of all, we found that in the 21 million, they most trust local governments. That is, when we look at federal and state, it's about the same. But when we ask about local government, 73% within the movement either see local government as their friend or ambivalent, and only 27% see local government as an enemy. This is very important because it means that mayors and other local leaders could potentially have an outsized influence over the movement. And this helps us to see a direction of going forward that heretofore we really haven't seen. So to answer General Milley's question and hold the line for American democracy, we need to move the line on research and analysis. I've just explained that we are now in stage three. We are doing extensive testing uh, of the insurrectionist sentiments in the general population. We are making discoveries as we do that, just by the way, as we did with COVID. Before extensive testing with COVID, we were flying blind. Up until now, I'm sorry to say, we've been flying blind uh, way too much with the insurrectionist movement. However, we need to move to stage four. In COVID, that was vaccine trials. Here, this means stress testing specific solutions. We don't just want to shoot from the hip. We want to have actual evidence before we proceed with solutions in a widespread way. And what do I mean? What are the pathways to stage four? We urgently need monthly and expanded nationally representative surveys through November 2022. We need surveys of the vulnerability of the U.S. military and, and our veterans to recruitment by militia groups. We need to build a network of independent experts so that we can build findings into viable policies. We need to test policy initiatives, and we need White House commitment to accelerate our understanding and our response. We have a clear flashpoint. The 2022 election season is coming, which is why it's crucial to move to stage four in the fall and in early winter. Thank you so much, Bob. That is uh, enlightening and uh, extremely frightening. Um, I wanna ask you some questions as we start. Uh, the first question that I'm sure many people will have is, Who's funding these studies? So there is no federal government uh, funding the studies. Uh, we have put together the, this, these studies from uh, the support from um, uh, Colonel Jennifer Pritzker's Tawani Foundation and other individuals support, uh, Mark Zivin, and Ari, and our CPOST board. And I wanna point out that that's very important support because these are these nationally representative surveys, and this is a probability sample of such a survey, so it's like the most uh, highest level. These are extremely in, in expensive investments, uh, 30, 40,000 at the low end of, uh, for these. Uh, these are extremely expensive. So the fact that we've been able to do it with the generosity of the Tuani Foundation and the other individuals supporting this is really quite, quite valuable and generous, and we thank them very much. 
So I wanted to ask you a couple of uh, questions that are slightly into the weeds, but I think very important. Um, your, uh, the findings that these are not just Republicans, quite interesting. But what we know is that when you ask people the top line question, are you a Democrat, a Republican, or an independent? Uh, for the general public, we get responses that have been roughly a third, a third, a third. But when you ask the next level, do you lean to one party or the other? We find that most Americans, 90%, uh, either are identified uh, themselves, as, have identified themselves as Republicans or Democrats or lean, and that the leaners behave much like the uh, self-identified ones. So when I look at that striking number of independents, did you ask that next question? We did. So this is very, yeah, Norm, so great point uh, here. So uh, we um, assessed it along a five-point Likert scale here. Uh, and also uh, we are using that as a binary. So we are joining together the responses of lean and uh, R as a one, uh, and then the others are a zero. So to be really precise, that's how the calculation is made. But we do have this unpacked. Um, and as we put out the top line findings uh, here, which we will be doing for the survey, others will be able to see that as well. So uh, break it down a little bit more then. Um, what proportion are both Republicans and independents who lean with Oh, them. geez. I'm, I've, I've got to just apologize. I don't have yeah. that just literally at the top of my fingertips, and I don't want to create any yeah. misinformation in our video here, which is just literally going to come out on our website. I mean, okay. as we speak, the, those top line findings are being put out on the website. And so okay. I don't want to get the percentages wrong, because you can imagine that will then introduce even more uh, uncertainty. You are a careful scholar. and I want to be very careful. You. We, we the, the data here, we stick to the data as closely as possible. And we do our very, very best not to overread the data, over and underreact, but also not to misreport it. Sure. I'll be a little less careful and suggest that there are probably a whole lot more people who are uh, Republican in one form or another uh, than uh, what yes. we've seen. But that's uh, very understandable. Very that understandable. Later. Yep, very Second uh, question that came to mind as I looked at the survey results, um, it's striking at how many uh, of these potential insurrectionists and some real ones uh, have had military service. But we know, Bob, that um, there's been a sub significant threat, you mentioned this in the stage four, uh, of heavy recruitment into police forces and the military of white supremacists. Do we know among this uh, group of uh, insurrectionists how many are currently serving or even roughly in police uh, forces or the military? Uh, not as well as we would like. Um, so in this survey uh, that we have done, um, we, in order to really answer that question, Norm, uh, we need a much more focused survey just on military experience. We are, in fact, heading to do exactly that. Now, why do I say that? It's because of the end that you need to really separate that out. So we have far more um, in this survey, we have far more with military service who are veterans than are serving. Um, but that is that allows us to say a lot about military service per se. But what we really want to do is go forward and we want to be able to understand the difference between current and veteran or current and former. Um, and that will require its own uh, focus um, uh, survey just of that population. Um, and we are um, heading in that way uh, as we speak. Good, um, because I think there are a couple of important things to keep in mind here. One, of course, is that we know some current members of the military and police forces were among the violent insurgents who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. The second thing we know is that some of those used techniques of low intensity warfare that they had learned in the military or uh, operations that they learned in police uh, uh, training. So knowing that we have former military people 
uh, is frightening because they know how to do this. Uh, we're not just talking about a group of people who think that they're going to form a mob and bring their guns along, but are completely disorganized. We know that there are people who know how to communicate internally, set up teams, and do the kinds of things that could make the next insurrection a more successful one than what we've seen. But of course, we also know that if we have people who are currently in police forces or the military, their threat, uh, even posing uh, as people trying to keep the peace while they're then going to turn and act, is an even greater one. Uh, so I, I can't agree with you enough, Norm. Yeah. Uh, this is very important in our other work on the demographics of who was arrested. Um, there are over 70 uh, individuals with former military service among those uh, arrested. And um, that's very important. And it's also important to know that it's really the military service number that we find as at least as important, if not more important than being in a militia group. Why do we say that? It's because there are many who participated in January 6th with military service that were not in militia groups. Yeah. And in our survey also, we see the same thing. Many more in, um, uh, and so many more in military service in the insurrection is 21 million than, in, than with militia group membership. So this is a very important thing you're calling attention to, Norm. And that's exactly why we want to move as expeditiously as we can this fall to this very focused issue on the military, the very focused issue. Uh, good. And I think uh, uh, Lloyd Austin would be very appreciative uh, as you do that as well. He is also uh, the Secretary of Defense flagged this as uh, an issue. Um, I wanted to parse down a little bit more also on trusting different levels of government. Yeah. Uh, and when we see people who uh, are a part of this movement, but who trust the federal government, do we know what they mean by that? Does that mean they trust the executive because Donald Trump was the president and maybe a lot of his people are still there? Uh, what about Congress? Uh, what about the courts? Knowing a little more about that would give us, I think, a better picture into their own psyches and also into what we might be able to do to head off some of the worst consequences. Uh, Norm, exactly right on the money, and also uh, what we're doing with our focus groups in latter part of August and September. You see, as you probably know very, very well, but I'm not uh, just to make sure the audience knows that what this is is a stream of research where one study is building on another, building on another. So what we have now is very important material and important findings, but also findings for focus groups that we can then drill into some of the underlying factors of a great replacement, seeing government as an enemy, um, uh, the Q, all of all of uh, not all of these, but a good half dozen, and we then uh, will be teed up for that next round of surveys where we can then use the focus groups to tease out how those play. Now we're we've already done this some, uh, but we're now be able to do it even more, and that's why I stress the importance of doing this work monthly and having stage one go to stage two, go to stage three, go to stage four. Uh, and we have the tools. We um, uh, know that we can use focus groups in conjunction with surveys. Um, and so we need to do this as, as very important before we get into the 2022 uh, election season. So let me now turn a little bit to Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump uh, instigated, uh, I would say, the January 6th insurrection. He started before the election. He has continued to have an incessant drumbeat that the election was stolen from him. Um, how important do you think Trump is in uh, expanding the number of people who believe that not just that the election was stolen, but that force is an appropriate measure? And uh, as a second level question, um, as we see all of these states now enacting laws that are built upon the idea that the election was not fair, and as we see this uh, 
phony audit going on in Arizona, uh, trying to make the case that the election was not fair. Uh, how important are those things in inflaming the views of this core group of people who are insurrectionist in attitude and could be in behavior? Excellent, excellent. So uh, first, on Donald Trump himself personally, our best evidence um, of the impact of Donald Trump personally comes by not so much this survey, but what we've done to compare the January 6th Stop the Steel rally to the two prior Stop the Steel rallies in Washington, one on November 12th and the other on December 14th. Most people don't even know about the prior two because they were smaller, not violent, even though right in front of the Supreme Court, the second one. Um, it was Donald Tr the difference between the size and then likely the behavior of the three different rallies um, was Donald Trump. So it's his tweets, which called many, many more people, his speech, which had an influence. And why do I say that? It's because we've studied all the court documents of the 570 who have been arrested, and they say so. <laughs> they say specifically, I came because my president called me. I did X because he told us to go and stop the certification. Now, to go a little bit further, what, is, what did we learn from our, our survey that relates to this? Well, what we learned is something really important for 2022, which is um, given the size of the 21 million with these radical and adamant insurrectionist beliefs, if we see political leaders call for violent action or more voter fraud claims in the 2022, we have to assume um, replays of what we saw on January 6th, and not just in Washington, but in state houses or other places around the country. Now, to come further to your last point, Norm, about the impact of the steel per se, um, so we have conducted uh, what's called a mediation analysis. This is a more advanced and more sophisticated style of, of statistical analysis. We're really quite uh, fortunate in our CPOS research team to have absolutely top uh, PhDs. These aren't students. These are, these are people that would have, you know, tenure, tenure track jobs. I mean, they're super talented. And so we are able to, uh, and what we see is uh, some clumpiness inside of the movement. Places where we can identify where the steel is really quite pivotal and some other places where it's not. Now, we need to be paused on this a little bit and, and not just jump forward. That's why I wanna stress test this a bit more in the future. But the, what that tells us, Norm, is that a lot of people are looking for a really quick fix. They want that silver bullet. They wanna know if we could just stop X, everything would just simply go away. Um, no, we're, we're learning, just as with COVID, we're learning bit by bit through science that we can make some progress and understanding, which can lead to helpful, viable solutions, but we need to build the evidence for those solutions. I want to stress this over and over. Um, so just like with COVID, when people started to say, should you wear a mask or not in February 2020, nobody really knew, and yet people gave answers to that. We're not doing that as CPOs. We're going to just take our time and we're going to do the best we can to have evidence for everything that we say. And uh, that's just great. That's the way we want this kind of research to go. We don't want to get a, ahead of ourselves. Um, just uh, one more. You know, the great replacement theory um, has been uh, pushed and promulgated uh, by a lot of people. Tucker Carlson is right in the forefront of that. And as he is spending this week in Hungary, uh, arm in arm with Viktor Orban, who is a leader in a, a slide towards authoritarianism uh, in uh, former democracies and applauding all that's been done. It struck me uh, yet again, first of all, at how this is um, not even a, a subtle way of making race and racism uh, a core part of what's going on, but also wondering about the role of these opinion leaders. Even if we know that people are not getting most of their information from, say, Fox, and my guess is that a lot of those who've gone to uh, OON uh, and uh, Newsmax uh, went there because Fox wasn't giving them quite enough of what they wanted. 
but uh, opinion leaders can have an influence uh, as a multiplier effect. So do you have any sense of whether beyond Trump that opinion leaders like Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram and the like uh, are having that significant multiplier effect? Well, what we can say is that for the group as a whole of uh, traditional mainstream media, which does include Fox, and when we analyze it, Norm, we do it as also an index. So it's as a group as a whole, we know that that is the larger influence on the movement than is social media. So just to be really, really clear. Um, now, um, also, we need to also understand that these ideas, as you're saying, are being directly promulgated in very uh, direct ways. And as we study violence around the world, so keep in mind, I come at this from studying political violence around the world. It is unfortunately all too common that we see political leaders and community leaders uh, for their own narrow purposes, be they political or otherwise, uh, doing things which stoke fires and then lead to violence. So I think we need to see that what's unfortunately seems to be coming together here in our country is uh, all too similar to that pattern we've seen around. So the, um, as we go forward, we're going to be drilling even more into the impact uh, here of, um, of spokesmen. That's a very important issue, Norm. Uh, but we need to see already that we have really quite reason to, to worry that people who might do um, make claims um, that are incendiary uh, and not understand it goes into uh, violence. That's been a common thing happening around the world, which has led to violence. And that may well be happening here. And that's the part we need to focus on is the violent potential of those ideas. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, people having ideas, everybody has ideas. Some of them can be more inflammatory than others. But if they don't act on them or have a potential to act on them, um, we're not going to be quite as concerned, even though we will be concerned. Let me turn to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience, Bob. Um, here's one. Uh, there's a difference between news sources and peer-to-peer -peer sharing on social media. And uh, he wants to know if the survey asked about news sources or did it ask people whether they shared opinions and posts between peers? Because uh, so much of this gets magnified, of course, when you get that email or that uh, message uh, that in, uh, uh, I am coming in saying, did you see this or can you believe this? And of course, some of these are framed so that they seem so reasonable and data filled when, of course, it's all made up. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely great question. Now that we have this data, you see, this is stage, the stage where we have the data makes this question really fabulous. But in order to answer it, this is similar to the US military. To really give a serious answer to the questions, um, a question like this, we need its own study. And not just as part of an omnibus or part of a broad, we need to focus. And the reason is because um, you need to collect several thousand people as respondents, a probability, a sample, a correct sample, and then really develop the questions around that issue. So no, we don't have that answer today. Uh, we'd love to be able to develop the answer to that, um, but it is exactly the right question once we have this baseline of information. And I want to stress again that um, stunning as these results are and important as this, these data are, that as you have said, we're in the middle of this. This is not a conclusion. This is a jumping off point to dig deeper into what is an incipient threat uh, for uh, all of us to consider. Um, another question, are you at all concerned that the accuracy of the polls might be affected by people not trusting authority and therefore not as likely to answer the polls, which would mean that the numbers you're getting would be even more frightening because it's leaving out some people uh, who feel that way but haven't uh, responded? Yeah, yeah. So, so in technical terms, there's something called social desirability bias. And social desirability bias means there's a reluctance of people in surveys or in when we have conversations 
to share some of their more extreme beliefs. And at CEPOS, we have done other surveys and survey um, work on ISIS and ISIS videos and support for ISIS in the United States. So we're very familiar with how hard it can be to survey, no matter how uh, statistically significant, survey the population to ask them questions about support for ISIS. So that's a, just to give you, so we have background in exactly this, this issue. That's, and what we, uh, we had a, a very hard time designing our questions in order to elicit actual um, variation with respect to ISIS. Well, that was a five-year project. So that we take that five years into this norm, and what we um, uh, one of the reasons we're so 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 we want to bring this forward to the public so much is we're not seeing shyness. This is not this is uh, these are not this is not the the idea of the shy Trump voter or the idea of now now it, it's true it, the shyness is usually just a few percent, and if you're talking about an election, a few percent can matter. Here, though, the numbers are really quite um, uh, concerning and large. And so, yes, it's possible it's larger, but this is large enough. I mean, if we're not already concerned with a population the size of Sri Lanka coming at us, um, we need to be we need to be concerned about this, and and not to go go off and overreact or underreact, but to do to build steadily, steadily our um, best diagnosis and solutions. That actually, you know, we've gotten a number of questions asking about methodology and about surveys. You know, one thing that uh, actually has just occurred to me is, are you going to do any panel surveys? Are you going to follow some of these people and see if it changes over time or if there are ways of um, seeing whether events change things? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that we are we are considering. Um, it is a matter of balancing our, our, so keep in mind the small resources we had to do this. Um, so we've been operating here with relatively tiny resources, certainly compared to COVID, right? But even compared to most national, national work at this scale. So in order to do the, um, these different ideas, we need to balance here uh, where we think we'll get the most bang for the for the and it, and so what we are doing is uh, we want to continue to monitor what we currently have. We already know we want to do focused um, uh, uh, future surveys with the focus groups. Uh, we would be delighted to have the capacity to be able to do a panel on top of that. Um, but that's what we're at. That's what's occur. That's what's occurring. So each of these is another uh, significant investment. The good news is that we are uh, at CPOST, we have the intellectual capability and bandwidth to be able to do that. So we're, we're not, because we're, we're very, we've, we've been doing work like this for some time now. Yeah, and I understand, uh, you know, doing good quality surveys, which is harder as a more general matter, given low response rates and uh, the, the, uh, the extra costs, uh, doing a panel survey, which for those who don't know, means asking the same people questions at different points is much more expensive. So, well, and also to say to do that between now and 2024, if yeah. we could, that would be really the, the per so what I would say the value of the panel is, Norm, is not between now and so much November 2022, but it's really between yeah. now and November 2024, because you need enough data points in your panel in order to really be able to assess the trajectory so and the trend. So what I would say is that if we could do that, that would be really terrific as a three-year plan. So we've had a bunch of questions asked about the urban uh, uh, mm -hmm. dominance uh, in uh, the insurrectionists. And uh, just to pull some of them together, uh, you've written before about uh, uh, having so many of these in counties that Biden won. Um, but just reflect a little bit more, Bob, on why you think these are coming from uh, urban areas, why they are coming from uh, the urban areas that are, uh, uh, you know, in Biden territory. Does it have something to do with, say, a backlash against cosmopolitanism um, or the more liberal views uh, that people in those areas have towards race uh, or social uh, uh, issues? 
uh, is it that there are more people uh, of color in those areas and that these are uh, you know, people who don't like it? Uh, reflect on yeah, that. So, so, so one, one of the big things that's happening, Norm, um, is that the uh, insurrectionist movement is mainstream much more mainstream than we are comfortable feeling. So we like our villains to be very far away from us in various ways. And what does it mean to be mainstream? Well, um, the audience may not know, but uh, only 20% by the different ways we count urban rule, and we have different measures by other very professional agencies that do this, only 20% of American population really lives in a rural area. So this can be measured in different ways, but it, no matter how you measure it, it always stacks up to about 18 to 20 percent. So finding that um, 70, 75 percent of the insurrectionist movement um, is is urban here, it means it's fitting a norm in uh, the uh, United States. And we need to understand that's what's going to happen when something goes mainstream if you see what I mean. So number one, mainstream. Number two, when we look specifically at the urban part, what we see is that's also the biggest location of the great replacement idea, separate from QAnon. QAnon is more rural than the great replacement, which is more urban. So we can structure the data that way as well. Um, and that then can um, uh, start to open some doors for us uh, for the future. So now that we have this understanding that we now know it's urban, it's great replacement in the future, we can do focus groups collected from people in urban areas who believe in the great replacement in order to peel the onion here and really try to separate out the different possible uh, issues as the questioner just asked. So the question is quite right. We have uh, now the not just a method with focus groups, but we know where to where we want to collect people from. You see what I mean? Um, and so that's really the value of what we can do now that we couldn't do before. And I'm really hoping that if we uh, we we'd be able to answer this by um, you know by the late fall or, or early winter. So give a real answer to this, not just a general guess. Um, as we have to do right now. Excellent. Um, there are a number of questions about the ambivalent group. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to have you dig in a little bit more into the ambivalent uh, group. What characterizes them? Do we know something more about who they talk to or interact with? What kinds oh. of media they use? Um, uh, you know, part of the reason, of course, is um, the ambivalent group could go one way or the other. Um, and knowing something more about them would be, I think, uh, very important. Yeah, I can just hear all the research teams saying, darn, I thought I was getting this weekend off. <laughs> <laughs> they worked pretty hard to get us to this point, <laughs> folks. Uh, so you're talking about a half dozen folks that have, have, have been sleeping as much, very much. Um, yeah. And so this is, so we have focused a lot on the uh, insurrectionist part um, here of those half moons and separating them from the others. We have not yet taken the ambivalent part and done um, uh, even a medium next step analysis, which we can do. And I can see Kevin Ruby saying, darn, and writing this down as we speak uh, here. Uh, but it is something that is, the, 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 the advantage we have with real data and data that's reliable and we can, um, uh, we, we can do different types of analyses in different portions of the data. And that's just a, um, a great asset. And why here, just as with COVID, science is, is one of the few friends we have. With the insurrection, science is one of the few friends we have. And before these studies, the insurrectionist movement was thought of as a blob. Um, well, now what we're doing is seeing contours. We're understanding different parts of it, much the way medical researchers biopsy a tumor. Once you know you have a tumor, um, and that can really be helpful. Um, and um, so uh, that's that's just great for the near the near future, like the next few weeks. <laughs> um, one question I wants you to break down the insurrectionists by age. Uh, yes, that's going to be in the top line. Yes, so that's something that will be coming 
um, here. Um, it's, it's fitting closer to the national distribution of age. Um, it's not quite as prominent. So in the, the January 6th insurrectionists, um, um, the, uh, the striking thing we found in studying all those who are arrested is uh, they were middle class and middle age. Well, here you're seeing also tend to see more middle class, middle age. That is more of a normal distribution. That is more mainstream. So I would just, just keep coming back to that the thing that we need to, if you need one word, it's mainstream, which means then the curves of the data will start to look like distributions in the general public. Good. And I, you know, we've had a couple of questions as well on uh, uh, economic anxiety. And I think you've answered that. Well, that, just to uh, add you've to answered it, it in two ways. Yeah. Yeah. So just to add to it. So we actually asked multiple questions about economic anxiety. We asked, um, do you fear losing your uh, sor main source of income in the next month, next year, like your job? How hard is it to pay a $500 surprising uh, uh, cost in the next month? And also, did you declare bankruptcy in the last five years? None of those, none of those are predictors of being in the movement. Now, that's really quite striking because many of my colleagues and scholars in the field of, of international political violence focus on economic issues as a driver. And economic issues are often viewed as a driver of uh, electoral support for Trump. We need to resist now thinking that who votes for Trump is the same as who fights for Trump. Um, what we're discovering is there is overlap, but it's nowhere near one to one. And on economic issues, that's really one of the striking um, areas that there's really, and, and now we've asked this actually multiple times in multiple different, and, and it's just not there. Um, and it's very striking uh, that it's not there. And, you know, I, I think we can uh, uh, also look beyond that uh, a whole host of political science research that's been done into Trump voters. And what we know yeah. is the support is white working class Americans along with evangelicals. And uh, when you parse it out further, um, they're not driven by their economic anxiety. They're not shaped in terms of behavior if things get better for them. Uh, we're seeing that even with survey results as um, all of the American Rescue Plan uh, money geared towards working class uh, and economically stressed people went out. Uh, it's race driven more than uh, it, it is uh, economics and uh, they interact. Well, we're seeing a lot of that yeah. here. And, and, and also we were surprised somewhat because we thought we'd find more support for the end times belief, the idea of the second coming of the yeah. Messiah. Uh, which is a core evangelical belief, by the way, um, we thought that religious belief would show up more in our insurrectionist movement. And we're just not seeing that over and over again. It's really quite striking. It's not that it's not there at all, of course. It's just not large and it's not statistically separate from the population as a whole. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions wondering whether uh, the people who are uh, investigating in Congress, uh, the uh, January 6th committee, or others uh, in uh, the law enforcement world or elsewhere have expressed interest in what you're doing and whether you're communicating with them and giving them some of your findings? Uh, not, not yet. Well, that just came into being. So that select committee has, yeah. hasn't been around all that long. And obviously they've had some very important things to do in those yeah. opening period. But we would be happy to share um, uh, this, uh, our website um, here at Seapost. If uh, you go to our website, you'll see lots and lots. This is, we've done five studies now. This is the fifth. There's a lot of material here to share and we would be absolutely happy to do that. And Warwick, I hope uh, maybe we can put into the chat um, that website um, so that people can uh, have immediate uh, access uh, to it. Um, looking a little bit further at the data, do you see um, a lot of differences between the North and South, the East, West, the central part of the United States? Yeah, not yet, not yet. We thought we might. So we have, I've also studied the, the sort of history of, of studies about violence in the United States. So in the 1960s, of course, we had uh, riots, uh, we had uh, in various cities. Uh, there, um, 
um, in uh, the analyses that were done do find um, 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 regional variation, especially in the South. Uh, that's not prominent here. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's not there because sometimes there's more um, smaller influences that are um, only revealed by more either much larger or more pointed studies. So I wanna be careful here. It, it just means it's not, it doesn't appear to be a large, uh, uh, geography doesn't appear to be a large component, but that it may be there at a second order and we just haven't been able to see it yet. So a couple more questions. Um, one, in your prior international terrorist work, have you found any effective antidotes against these negative movements? Uh, yes, understanding. So suicide terrorism. So my work on suicide terrorism took uh, really uh, after 9-11, I compiled the first complete database of all suicide attacks around the world. At that point, most people thought that suicide terrorists were uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalists, that is all religious attackers. My work showed that the world leader in 2003 was actually a secular group, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, which most people just didn't know about. Um, and that had a very powerful effect, Norm, because by bringing that data to the government and actually the Defense Department under George W. Bush, who I was telling was doing the wrong thing with the Iraq war, they were the funders of CEPOS that started CEPOS. And it's because by getting a more granular understanding of the motives of suicide attackers, that's what allowed us to have a granular understanding of um, AQI in Iraq, which led to the Anbar awakening, which then led to diminishing the group. So suicide terrorism is not a big problem today. Um, and one of the big reasons is because um, it took a few years, but because we were able to get fine grained diagnoses of the motives and that led to far better sets of policies. Uh, knowledge won't solve everything, Norm. There's still politics to be sure, but it does help. And that's what we saw with suicide terrorism. Um, many people after 9-11 thought there was nothing that could be done, just like after the insurrection. There's nothing that could be done. Well, science can be helpful. So here's a question from uh, somebody who's written a lot about these uh, important subjects, Bart Gelman. Did you probe, aside from great replacement, for indications of white nationalist or white supremacist views more directly as a driver of insurrection? Uh, no, not in this particular one, Bart. So I've known Bart for a long time. <laughs> He's a super, one of our, our real, like, cream of the cream uh, uh, here in journalism. Um, and uh, no, not in this one, because our goal here was widening that aperture. So we had already found evidence for the great replacement back in our March survey. Uh, then uh, a lot of the questions afterwards were, well, let's widen this aperture and especially drill into anti-government in various ways. So that's what we did. Um, and we had to make some choices as we went through. So no, we didn't, we didn't add to that uh, at this, at the, for this one in June, uh, but we are certainly interested. Where we did add, I just wanna throw out something that's interesting here, is um, we did add a, add a question about whether or not people believe that women who complained about sexual harassment were doing more harm than good. And I don't know if you notice on that slide, if you, when you go, folks go back to look at it, you'll see there's a thing called Me Too skepticism. It's not quite a driver, it just misses being statistically significant, but it is really quite striking how close that skepticism, that, that uh, answer fits with a pattern here. So there may be a wider pattern, not just within white supremacists, but also uh, with the idea here of um, paternalistic. Uh, uh, and so that's something that we found uh, really quite striking and we're considering how we can build on that going forward. So I'm gonna ask you just one more question, uh, Bob. Um, and that is, um, uh, somebody asked about the root causes of this, but what struck me uh, as a question is, oh, we know that the QAnon people, that that's a, a recent phenomenon. It's clearly been manipulated over several years and continues to be. It's taking people uh, and giving them this sort of insane view that 
becomes almost cult-like uh, in this belief that there's this pedophile uh, cabal. Um, but the larger group out there, the question is, how much of this do you think is a new phenomenon? Now, it may be newer in terms of the willingness to consider violence. We certainly know that um, concerns about race, that race has been the fundamental driver of divisions in our society going back a very, very, very long time. I've said multiple times in the last few years that uh, this period doesn't remind me as much of the pre-Civil War period as it does of the uh, 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 one that followed uh, the Reconstruction uh, era, where we saw this backlash after uh, uh, we had slaves freed to try and divide uh, the uh, poor whites and black uh, blacks in the South uh, by the plantation owners and others. But whatever it may be, the, the, the question is, how much of this is new and manipulated by these elites like Trump? How much of it do we think would be there and just latent or um, ready to emerge if Trump had not come along or if somebody else would have been the next Trump? And so, I know that's speculation, but- well, uh, well, it is, but the thing that might be helpful to put it into a frame is what's new about the insurrection is collective political violence on the right. Now, before the insurrection, we had political violence on the right and extremism and, and even deaths, but these are happening by either lone wolf individuals or very tiny groups who look like militia groups. So it's no surprise that before January 6th, uh, the FBI and a lot of folks would be focusing on trying to track these individual lone wolves or tiny groups and cells like those who uh, tried to kidnap and kill Governor Whitmer. What we saw on January 6th that's really different is collective political violence. And it was a large number of people who rushed into the Capitol. Uh, this was not just a handful, and it's not just the militia groups. That's that's not the case. So that's what we're trying to understand. Um, and that's difficult to see. It's not just about what happened over, say, the last 20 or 30 years, because we haven't had instances of that. Undoubtedly, that means there is some significant role for political leaders to galvanize those sentiments together. That's why I mentioned Trump's role different in Jan 6 than the previous two rallies. So there is certainly, I think, um, credible evidence that that played a pivotal factor. Um, but what I would also say is that the period of time this may be closest to is possibly the early 1920s. So in 1920, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, became a national movement with only a few thousand people in 1920 to six million by 1924. This was also, of course, in Georgia, but it was in Indianapolis. It was in Ohio. It was in many different parts of the United States. This occurred and galvanized very, very quickly. What was one of the key things galvanizing it? The inflow of Italian Catholics. My grandfather was one of them and were from World War I. There was a huge influx of Italian Catholics, which was galvanizing and causing fear among white Protestants and especially business owners and middle class and that who is what that's what the Klan were they were and so it's uh, we have lots of uh, documented books histories on this that's probably the period that this resembles the most I would say um, and also gives us a lot of concern for how quickly um, this these this can uh, be congealed. Um, and that's really why, just to end, we need to do much more work and keep the pedal to the floor, certainly between now and November 2022, um, and probably all the way through November 2024. That's uh, a, a, a good uh, way to um, end. I would just add one more note, which is we know that the Secret Service and the FBI downplayed the threat of violence. We know that for a significant period of time, they have not treated white supremacist uh, threats of violence with the gravity uh, that they deserve. 
And I would just hope that the work that you've done so far, the pathbreaking work, the work that lies ahead, will uh, be a jolt to the authorities to understand uh, the clear and present dangers that uh, we face and that may grow uh, as we look to 2022 and 2024. Uh, with that, we had a, a very robust audience and some excellent questions. And um, thank you so much. And thanks again to the Stevenson Center. And unless, uh, Nancy, you want to close things out? I want to uh, say thanks to both of you on behalf of the Stevenson Center, but on behalf of the nation, because Robert Pape said over and over again, knowledge helps. And without knowledge, we won't know how to respond and how perhaps we can help the authorities respond appropriately, as Norm just mentioned. And the way we as observers and readers of our uh, media can internalize what's going on and not panic, but perhaps help in the spread of knowledge, help people understand what we can do, we the public can do to calm the situation and make the world smoother so that these forces can't take over quite so vehemently. I want to apologize at the beginning of the program, we had some glitches, but the quality of the conversation that you two carried on totally compensated for a few of our uh, errors. And we're so, so grateful for both of you and uh, for the work that you both do uh, long term to keep the public informed and to keep us moving forward instead of backward. The fear of the 20s coming back to us, the fear of uh, uh, those civil war uh, responsive responses coming back to us are good warnings for the things that we must do as citizens to pave the way to a better future. So thank you, Robert Pape and all of your workers. Thank you, Norm, for your excellent uh, long-term observations of trends in the country. And the meeting is closed with such gratitude to both of you. Thank you. And thank you very much. And Norm, thank you. So it's wonderful. And Nancy, just thank you for everything you've done. This is just absolutely splendid. And, um, uh, and I just can't tell you what a pleasure it is to, after all the years of watching uh, Norm Ornstein inform the world, to have him as part of this. Uh, this just is really just true. It was, a, it was a perfect meeting. And thanks, Norm, for reminding us. We will certainly post. Uh, your website so that uh, people can see your data uh, and see it as you update it with all these new research uh, manuals coming out. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you Nancy. Bye.